buenas noches. Good evening uh, and welcome everybody and our special event with Alice Charles in order to discuss about the smart cities and the sustainability. Which is the trend in order to discuss about the smart cities and the sustainability. Which is the trendy topic this week as Barcelona is hosting on these days the Smart City Expo World Congress and also just five days uh, after the end of the COP26 in, in Glasgow. My name is Gabriele Palma and as a managing director of Casa Seat, I would like you to welcome and thank you for participation. And I also have the pleasure to introduce Elise Charles, who is in fact a very special guest uh, for Casa Seat having with us a representative of one of the most prestigious institutions as uh, the World Economic Forum. Helis, please consider Casa Seat as your house in Barcelona and Spain. Who is Helis, in fact? Helis Charles leads the cities and real estate work streams in the World Economic Forum. This includes the Global Future Council on Cities and Urbanization, the future of real estate, co-leading the Net Zero uh, Carbon Cities and the Biodiverse Cities Initiative, the production of all cities and real estate-related content and events at the World Economic Forum, which also includes Davos. Helis has 19 years' experience working in the areas of city, urban environment development, town planning, real estate, infrastructures, environment, climate change, and public policy globally. That's why I think we will have uh, something to learn uh, this night. Uh, Elise, I hope uh, I didn't make so many mistakes in the presentation to you. And before giving the floor, just let me explain to the audience how we are going to handle this session. So first, I will invite Elise to make a short presentation to share his view, her view on sustainability as my cities. And after a short and inspiring uh, speech, I will initiate a debate and also ask to some experts that we have here tonight uh, to react and ask some questions. And finally, I will also open the floor to any of you who want to raise some additional questions or comments. Uh, therefore, and having said that, so dear Alice, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the invitation. Um, and it's wonderful to see a full house um, despite COVID-19 restrictions, etc. Um, and also, I believe we have some people who are joining us online. So welcome everybody online as well. Um, so what I'm going to talk to you about is about the future of cities. And I'm going to talk about the role of enabling technology. So a couple of years ago, if I was talking to you, I probably would have said smart cities. But I think the, the focus has changed much more to technology as an enabler rather than widgets and gadgets. Um, so so that's, uh, that's the focus of, of my presentation. So just to run through, in terms of structure, I'm going to broadly take you through the future of cities, the role of enabling technology, so the way it's seen as an enabler. And finally, um, also, I'm going to just briefly mention what we're doing in the forum in this area. Um, some of my slides have words on it. I'm not going to speak to all of those words, but it's purely for you to take away and read afterwards if you wish. So, so that's the purpose. OK, so COVID-19 has accelerated huge trends in our cities, and that has revealed both challenges and opportunities. And I guess, first of all, we've seen huge human behavioral shifts. So, you know, we've had to adjust to working from home. And that has made us want more space in, in many of our residential units in which we lived in. But also we have, as I say, been working from home. And we've also seen this huge shift towards e-commerce. So if you were in China or Hong Kong before the pandemic, you were already part of that revolution. You were already experiencing e-commerce. Um, but that is certainly something that's, that's more new in the European context and even the American context. Um, for me, my business travel has dramatically reduced. <laughs> I've tended to be in a different part of the world every single month, and that has changed. But also, we have seen challenges in terms of affordability. We had an affordable housing crisis before COVID-19, but that crisis has become even greater since COVID-19. And many of you may have seen the recent IMF 
um, you know, financial, uh, sorry, global financial stability report, which was highlighting the risk to the global economy associated with house price increases. Um, but equally, we've seen city revenues fall, and I'll come to that in a second. In terms of health and wellness, before COVID-19, it was really only the most progressive developers of real estate, for example, that were focused on the wellness agenda in terms of the built environment. Now it's very much mainstreaming. Um, but equally, technology, if we think about um, many of the providers of infrastructure and services within cities, they, they were somewhat behind other industries in terms of technology, but we've seen a much wider adoption of technology. But the big agenda is decarbonization. Yes, it was up for discussion before COVID-19, um, but we've really seen the agenda around the ESGs come on board. So we're only seeing investment in accordance with the ESGs. It's fair to say that it's very much focused on the E. The S and the G are, west, uh, are less well-defined. So the focus is on investing in accordance with the environmental agenda. Um, but also we've seen the decarbonization movement towards trying to decarbonize our supply chains promoting walking and cycling and micro-mobility and the electrification of mobility and embracing the circular economy, but also, you know, in addressing those operational emissions associated with our cities, particularly our buildings in terms of trying to get to energy efficiency. But we've also seen a new focus on resilience in our cities. It's no longer just seen as addressing climate, but it's also financial shocks, it's health shocks, etc. So there's been huge shifts. But we've also seen a huge impact on the finances of our cities. We've seen huge reductions in property taxes, in sales taxes. We've also seen reductions in returns on investment, but at the same time, expenses have increased in terms of health, sanitation, et cetera. So the worst best case example on that slide is New York, which had a budget deficit last year of nine billion, but cities right across the world have a difficulty. Yet they say they want a green and just recovery. And you know, one, one of the centerpieces of the recovery strategy is the promotion of the Paris 15-minute city. And Carlos Moreno um, has been here in Barcelona, he's still in Barcelona, um, I, I met him last night. And, you know, he's very much promoting that we create neighbourhoods uh, that enable us to avail of all the services that we need to live, work and play within 15 minutes of where we live. And, of course, he's an advisor to the mayor of Paris and that became a central part of her re-election campaign. But it's fair to say that's not a new idea. The city of Melbourne has been focused on this for a very long time through their 20-minute neighbourhood, for example, and many other cities as well. And that is very much promoting uh, a scenario where we're creating neighbourhoods which we can walk in, which we can cycle in, have local transportation, have local jobs, local retail, local education facilities, local parks, play spaces, but also different mixes of housing tenure um, with affordable housing, uh, the ability to age in place, and overall ad agenda is diversity in terms of types of housing. And of course, the other thing that we've seen during um, COVID-19 and this effort was led by the mayor of Milan, Beppe Sala. He is part of, of the C40 Mayors Network, which is very focused on, on the climate agenda. Um, and they created a green and just recovery task force, which Mayor Beppe Sala chaired. And they um, you know, came up with a set of principles around how they want to you know, uh, build back for a green and just recovery. And that's very much focused on they will not be returning to business as usual. They will be adhering to science. They want to deliver excellent public services. They want to ensure that the recovery is equitable, for example. Uh, but equally, they're recognizing the role of technology and the jobs that that can create in enabling this green and just recovery. But they're also recognizing they need to work with national government and they need to work with international institutions and investors to finance that recovery. At the same time, the EU has a huge agenda in the space in terms of sustainability. And what they want is for 100 cities across the EU to be carbon neutral and smart cities by 2030, and all cities within the EU to be climate neutral and smart by 2050. 
And I guess many cities do not know that next year the EU is going to be asking them to enter into a climate contract, which is going to ask them to set out how they're going to get to carbon neutrality by um, 2030. And what they do want is at least one city for each member state to commit to this. So cities are not going to escape this agenda. Um, I also want to mention COP26, as we're just out of it last week. And, and I'm not going to go through everything. I think this is you know, primarily here for you to read afterwards, but some of the big headlines in terms of what does it mean for cities. So 733 cities from around the world committed to the race to zero. What it, so what is the race to zero? It's a global campaign which is led by the United Nations and also the COP chair, which commits to have emissions within cities. It's, and in fairness, it's not just cities signed up to it, businesses signed up to it as well, regions signed up to it, etc. But they're agreeing to have their emissions by 2030, which is a very significant ask in itself. Also, we've seen um, there's the Race to Resilience movement, um, which its cities are also part of. And we've seen metrics released, um, which provide universal tools for cities and businesses to measure success in relation to resilience. We also seen a new coalition launched for cities and the construction sector, which is around addressing those embodied admissions that's associated with um, con the construction sector, particularly coming from building materials and furnishings. Um, and we also seen a coalition of international investors announced that's focused very much on zero emission bus fleets. And we've seen the UK announce its new urban climate action program, which is going to focus on investment in cities, particularly in the global south. Um, and uh, I also want to mention that the Global Alliance for Buildings and Construction, which UNEP holds the secretariat of, launched the Global Heat Forum. Um, and also, the, the Future is Public Transport campaign was launched, um, as well as the Glasgow de Declaration on the Acceleration of the Transition to Zero Emissions Vehicles. So you can see there's a number of outputs. From our perspective, we also have a number of, of initiatives that we launched, but um, i rather show the work of others rather than ours, and I'll come to that a little bit later. In terms of the role of technology, so, you know, Smart cities has been around for about 15 years now. And when it started off, it was very much about technology companies inventing solutions that they thought, OK, this is what's going to solve cities' problems. And we're going to go out there, and we're going to walk into the CTO's office, and we're going to seek to sell our products to that city. That didn't work. That resulted in a plethora of pilot projects around the world, the majority of which failed. Why? Because they didn't focus on what people within that city actually wanted. They didn't focus on the unique context of that particular city. And what we've seen in 2017 and 2018 was many of the large corporates in the smart city spaces decide, we're shutting down our smart cities business. We're merging it in with our you know, larger sort of public sector and government business. And do you know what? That's been good because it's actually made um, these big technology companies think differently and turn up differently to City Hall. And it's allowing cities to say what citizens need within their city and develop solutions as a result. So having said all that, what I do want to say is technology has a huge role. It's, it's an enabler. It can enable us to inform, to engage, to simulate, to replace, to intensify, and to streamline. And I guess cities are very much focusing on the outcomes associated with technology right now. So, you know, they're focusing on how data can drive decisions, how it can inform participation, and on human-centric design. But also, cities are, are, are focusing on agile approaches to plan, to design, and to implement. And yes, they were focused on it before, but to a much greater extent. And cities are recognizing the strategic role of data. And we're start starting to see chief data officers within cities. And I guess they're making um, data-driven decisions, but also they're recognizing that if you analyze your data in a more effective way, you can offer better services to a city. So 
An example is, you know, the mayor of Helsinki, it's really good, the former mayor of Helsinki rather, was really good at this, and he developed a whole data department. And one of the things that they did was also leverage data to find a better way to offer citizen school places. So before you had numerous forums, et cetera, you had to fill, and then, you know, citizens started receiving an SMS saying, we believe that your child will be going to school in September. This is the school that we're offering. Do you say yes or no? And you just had to respond to a text message to select a school rather than a forum. So data analysis can enable that kind of service offering within a city, and that's important. And um, also, I guess, we are also seeing a more, more reactive model being embraced in our cities. and Sorry, a more proactive model, I should say, rather than a reactive model being embraced in our cities in, in relation to data. But what we need to uh, enable technology to be used more effectively in our cities is we need leadership, we need governance, and we need financing. And in terms of leadership, that means we need to have leadership within the city, whether it's the CTO, a CIO, a chief digital officer. So a mayor needs to commit to it. They need to put the relevant executives in there. But they also need to have a strategy. And they need to find their own flavor. In that context, what I mean is, yes, you will find amazing solutions when you go to conferences like the Smart Cities Expo. But you have a unique context in your city. And you have to ask, will that work in my city? But I think equally, you have to audit what you put out there and see, are citizens using it? I think that's a central point. You know, I was recently on a jury for the EU, and we were interviewing many cities, and they were telling us about all of these apps and you know, technologies they put out there. And when you ask them the question, have you audited this? Have you looked at user penetration? Most of them said no. So, you know, it's not just good enough to put out solutions. You have to look at, at uh, how used it is. But also, I just wanted to flag that I think governance is critical. And that's, you know, in terms of having the digital solutions as a tool to put citizens back into the center of the city, ensuring that you're joining forces across all levels of government. This is a really important point. Governments often operate in silos. You need to have skilling across all levels of government if you're going to embrace technology. And you need better measuring and monitoring of the outcomes, which I've just talked to. So financing and partnership. This is a, is a really important point. Um, I think at the moment, because of the financing constraints of cities, many cities may jump into partnerships with uh, private sector partners without fully thinking it through. Um, and, and, and I think that's what cities need to be focused on. They need to be thinking about, you know, what is the outcome we want to deliver for our city? Will this partnership deliver that outcome? Um, you know, for example, we, we are seeing a lot of uh, surveillance technology being deployed in cities around the world. And that partnership could be between a major technology provider who will provide the infrastructure um, and perhaps a city police force. And they'll say, OK, we will surveil your city um, and we will share the revenue 50-50. So if somebody does something wrong in your city, they see it on the surveillance technology, they send a fine to that person, the city gets 50% of the revenue, and the, uh, the provider of the infrastructure gets 50% of the revenue. But you also have to think about the rights of the citizens who you're surveilling. So I think it's really important to think through that partnership before you embrace it. So we did a huge survey of cities, and we asked them to you know, identify the most important digital infrastructure and capabilities in cities. So they said um, connectivity and uh, computing was, was essential, digital services, data and analytics, accessibility, also helping them with their strategy and collaboration, and digital skills and innovation, and also to help them in terms of regulation and partnership framing. So that was what they wanted their digital infrastructure and capabilities for. So our recommendations in terms of enabling cities to utilize digital infrastructure, it's very much to sort of get your internal governance right, engage your stakeholders, and focus on delivery excellence. So it, when I turn back to internal governance capabilities and processes, 
It's about establishing the leadership, which I've already allude, alluded to, finding your own flavor, which I've also referred to, doing the inside job, so that's breaking down those barriers, that's also ensuring that you're upskilling your citizens, um, it's so they're digitally literate. It's amazing the amount of people that's not digitally literate within a city. Um, and it's also exploring the strategic role of data, how you can make evidence-based decisions, but how you can offer different services based on data. But throughout that journey, you must engage stakeholders. So you understand what citizens need on the one hand, you understand how they're responding to what you're delivering on the other hand, and you must focus as a city on delivery excellence. So start with the needs um, of the user, you know, design for privacy, design for security, design for rights of citizens, and deploy agile processes and actively manage change and, and iterate as you, as you uh, respond. So very, very quickly, some of the things that we're doing at the World Economic Forum, we have um, a CEO's community from the real estate sector, it's real estate investors, it also would bring together cities, et cetera, which is focused on the future of real estate. You know, they have delivered work which looks at the future of the real estate sector, and this just shows you some of their thinking in terms of how we need to create more livable, sustainable, resilient, and affordable cities. And they see enablers of that in terms of technology, regulatory systems, talent, for example, value proofing, and stakeholder engagement. And um, building on that, they've also released these green building principles, which were released just before COP26, which is a set of principles to try and get our building stock across the world to net zero carbon. We also have a net zero carbon cities initiative. This is actually bringing a variety of different communities together. So it's the energy utility companies, the energy technology companies, it's the mobility companies, it's the real estate companies, it's also investors, financiers, and then, of course, it's national and city government and it's civil society and academia, because all of those sectors need to work together if you're going to get to net zero in our cities. So why? Because most of the emissions in our cities around the world come from energy, come from mobility, and come from buildings. So if you're not addressing those big three, and yes, of course, there's many other things you need to work on, but they're the big three, that's the reality. If you're not addressing those three, you're not going to get to net zero. And really what we are proposing there is we need to focus on clean electrification. So we need to decarbonize our electricity grids. We need to digitalize our electricity grids. And we see the issues with energy supply across Europe right now. We need to focus on mobility, and that means electrifying our mobility systems, but also you know, encouraging public transport, looking at the, how we can enable micromobility, how we can have electric vehicles uh, you know, rather than the, the guzzlers that we have right now, but also how we can create ultra-efficient buildings. And one final piece that's attached to net zero carbon cities, and this city is quite good at it, actually, um, is cities must be compact. You cannot be a net zero carbon city if you're a sprawling city. I'm showing Pittsburgh versus Stockholm, for example. Pittsburgh, Stockholm, similar size of population. Pittsburgh, five times the amount of emissions of Stockholm, for example. So it, it shows you the importance of density within a city. Um, and finally, some of the work that we're doing at the moment also, and this is partnered with the, uh, the president of Colombia, is on biodiverse cities, so how we can create nature-positive cities um, in, in, in the future. We also have work on uh, social inclusion and urban inclusion, which is, is a major topic, actually, at the Smart Cities Expo this year, which is really great to see. Um, and today we won an award <laughs> at the Smart Cities Expo for our G20 Smart Cities Alliance, which is uh, an alliance focused on creating technology governance uh, for cities. And we also have a global uh, new uh, mobility coalition, which is focused on how we can electrify our mobility systems and embrace autonomous mobility around the world. So I'm going to stop there. So th th thank you very much, Alice, uh, for sharing your knowledge. It was really helpful, inspiring. I think we learned something uh, tonight. And uh, I would like to ask you, uh, you told us that uh, you were in Glasgow uh, two weeks ago 
What, what is your balance of the uh, COP26 results? <laughs> really good question. Um, many years ago, I used to work uh, with an environment minister. So, and, and we had the presidency of the EU during that time. So a COP is, is about negotiation between member states. And when you're representing a block of EU countries, you're negotiating with, you know, African countries as a block, you know, small island nations. So in that sense, it's a bit of a circus, right? There's, there's, you go in with a position and you hope for progress and you may not necessarily come out with the progress that you want. I, I think that we wanted to see more progress mm. at COP26. Um, there's a lot still to be done. Uh, I certainly would have liked to have seen that China was there. Um, you know, it would have been great to see greater commitments from India. You know, in reality, we're talking net zero by 2050, but China is talking net zero by 2060, and India is talking net zero by 2070. So, um, so that's a long way off. So, I, I think uh, I definitely would like to have seen greater yeah. progress. But having said all of that, um, the interesting thing is whilst nation states are talking, cities are acting. Um, so we are seeing, and we even seen that under Trump, right? Yeah. When he was saying, okay, uh, you know, forget about climate, his cities were saying, no, 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 we're going to continue. So I I in that sense, I, I feel like cities are just getting on with it yeah. whilst nations are talking. Um, and that's really positive. And it's also, I think, really positive to see how cities are turning up to events like COP26, increasingly getting um, a seat, not at the main table, but at a table, um, and creating their own agenda. So I think that's really important. So to answer your question, would have loved to see more progress, but whilst nations are talking, cities are acting. At least there was a strong focus. <laughs> yeah. uh, I have another question for you. It's more related to what we do. Uh, as you know, uh, SEAT and Cupra are fully engaged in the electrification. And uh, I would like to understand see, what, what is your point of view regarding the real challenges that the electrification uh, will have, will face. You know, we're starting to see some of them now in Europe, aren't we? Um, so when I worked many years ago in government, my dossier was the CO2 car emissions legislation yeah. for the EU. So. Um, I'm very familiar with, uh, with that, that agenda. I think what was interesting back then was there was different positions of member states within the European Union, um, depending on the type of car that they were producing. So, uh, you know, if you were producing smaller cars with lower emissions, you were very progressive and quite happy to go with that agenda. Also, if you were uh, a country that um, you know, the, the manufacturer was already investing heavily in electrification. Yeah. You were happy with a progressive agenda. If you were a member state that produced very big, luxurious cars with uh, a lot of emissions, you were certainly not happy with that agenda. So, there was, you know, what they always said in those negotiations was 2020 was really difficult in terms of getting production of uh, electric cars in time to meet that agenda. But we are seeing now more and more manufacturers are producing the cars. So that, that's no longer a problem. So what is the problem? Infrastructure is a huge problem that we just haven't seen the, the rollout of um, the charging infrastructure um, to the extent that we would like. Um, I guess charge times is a barrier in terms of you know, making uh, people want to have an electric vehicle. They're concerned about that. Will I be, find myself stranded? So you know, um, it, assuring citizens that you can overcome that barrier is, is a really important point. But also, I think, providing the incentives. Um, because you know, we've seen incentives in some countries, but we've seen that it's the higher end of the market that's actually availing of those, those incentives rather than the lower end of the market. So how can you um, have a just transition yeah. to the electrification of mobility? I think it's a really important point. But also, how can we provide the energy for yes. it, right? That's and, and uh, you know, we're not investing in our electricity grid infrastructure in Europe, and we need to invest in our electricity grid infrastructure. Because if we're moving towards electrification, yeah. we, need we need it. More yeah, so I, I think um, 
that is, for me, that's probably the biggest barrier is that we're not right. seeing the investment. But it, we also know that it takes, there's a long lead in time for yes. investment in infrastructure yes. mega projects. So uh, in, in that sense, that concerns me that we're just not seeing um, enough attention on uh, investment in the, the, the electricity grid infrastructure. So thank you so much. I think that's something that I, I, I fully share. Uh, I, I, if, I, if you allow me, I would like to start with some experts that are tonight with us to address you some specific questions and to continue the dialogue. And I know that we have uh, together with us uh, Justina Bieber, uh, Baber, uh, who is the community leader of IKEA Retail Experience, and I think she has a question for you. Yeah, hi. Uh, thank you very much for the fantastic and very insightful presentation. Um, what we've been pondering together with my colleagues here over the last days, and with the points that you have uh, emphasized, emphasized in your presentation, we see the context of cities changing, cities becoming smarter, but also more human-centric. On the other hand, we see changing consumer expectations and needs over the period of the COVID uh, pandemic, but also before with um, the growing e-commerce. How do you think these changes will impact uh, e-commerce and retail in general? Um, of course, then also affecting uh, big retailers like IKEA. Mm. So. Um We've looked a lot at this in the, the future of real estate work that we did, and you probably would find it very interesting because we, we of course, looked at, at cities, but we deep-dived into the future of retail, the future of logistics, um, and so on and so forth. Um, turning to retail, uh, so if we look very carefully at China and Hong Kong, which you know has had a focus on e-commerce for a very long time, um, what we do know is that there's both an online and an offline presence. Um, and that offline presence is more about experiencing a product. So we, the consumer, go to see, experience the product. What we do know from e-commerce as well is that since we started purchasing a lot more online, we're actually sending a lot more products back. We're not happy with what arrives. We haven't seen it. We haven't experienced it. So what has happened in, in China, even with the growth of e-commerce, is that you still had this offline presence so that people could go and experience the product and then they may end up buying it online at, at, at another time. They may find like a cheaper option online somewhere. So, you know, I guess what we're saying is that we think there's a future for, for offline retail. Um, we're still going to continue with e-commerce, maybe not to the same extent, but retail may, the, the footfall may end up reducing. So, so you know, the, the amount of real estate that a, real, uh, a, a company needs, and I think Zara was one of the first to say, we're going to reduce the number of stores that we have, we're going to change our stores, and they're often a first mover in, in the retail space. So we're likely to see smaller retail outlets, and it's going to be much more about uh, experience in the product. In terms of um, logistics facilities, um, we have really seen a huge focus on digitalization of logistics, um, you know, logistics facilities through the pandemic. One of the things that we also grappled with was nearshoring. So, you know, if you had the uh, Ellen MacArthur from the Ellen MacArthur Foundation here, she would be pointing out the amount of food that's actually wasted before it even reaches the shop. Um, so that's a serious issue. There's serious emissions come from food as well. So I think that there, there is more customer demand for trying to localize produce as well. And of course, that will require a more localized distribution. But we will see, I believe, in terms of logistics, a big focus on the last mile delivery. Um, and in that context, you know, if you think about what happened during the pandemic, a lot of uh, car parking spaces were removed. There's a lot of restrictions in place in terms of bringing cars into cities. So does that create an opportunity for our underground car parks to make them into logistics, last mile logistics facilities in the future? We think so. Um, so, so that's kind of what we're thinking uh, in that space. I hope that answers your question. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank, you, thank you very much, Justina. 
And uh, we have also tonight with us uh, Octavio de la Varga, who is the General Secretary at Metropolis. And uh, thank you so much for being with us, Octavio. And Octavio also would like to raise a question to uh, Elis. Thank you. Thank you, and hi, Elis, and thank you for your insightful presentation. Uh, well, in fact, it's two questions, already three. It's two, <laughs> two and, and another one. First, you were talking about the governance issue, no? which you know is critical as well for us, for, for Metropolis, the association of major metropolises and cities. And do you think that the, the way we're still working at local level and with different tiers of government, no? local, it's like municipality, region, nation state, are we, are we up for the challenges, mm. you know, say, in terms of governance? Or do we, need, do we need to rethink the way we govern our cities and the way we, we work on the different tiers of government? So that would be one. And the other ones are related to the global agendas. One is the, the, the Agenda 2030 and the SDGs. Mm. As you know, all the local governments were rushing into aligning and localizing SDGs yeah. without thinking about the consequences many times. And then you have national governments also aligning SDGs, and there's no dialogue. I have the feeling that there's no dialogue between local governments and national governments. So there we are missing as well possibilities, making efficiencies, and I don't know. Well, I would like to know your opinion. Yeah. And then relating to the, 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 the climate change agenda and the COP26, apart from the Global Mayors Compact and the Zero Race, do you think there should be any other, or can you foresee any other global initiative of local governments tackling the climate change issues? So, uh, first of all, really good to see you. It's yes. been a long time. It's been a long time, yeah. <laughs> um, so, um, uh, turning to your first question on governance, you know, if you think about something like net zero carbon cities, it's absolutely impossible to deliver on that agenda if you do not have all of arms of government working together. <coughs> so, you know, even the different arms of local government, you know, I, when I, I was talking to the EU about this and I was saying, okay, if you look at Paris, Paris is only a very small part of Paris. There's all of these other, there's central Paris, the Paris, you know, city, city council. And then there's all these other local authorities that are actually part of greater Paris. But if you're going to get Paris as a whole to net zero, you need all of those local governments working together and you need one single climate contract for the whole of Paris. And, and there's so many cities right across Europe, um, indeed my, my home city of Dublin, it's the exact same thing, um, you know, that, that have, like Dublin has four local authorities. So it's, it's very normal that you have a number of local authorities, first of all, London, think about all the boroughs. Yes, you have greater London, but you have all the boroughs. So First, you need to get local government working together and have a single vision, which is for the future of that metropolitan area. Um, the second thing is, yes, national government, you know, agrees to um, international agreements, like they negotiated the, agree the agreement at COP26, but most of the actual implementation happens at the local level. And cities are generally not party to uh, the negotiation. They're not formally party to the negotiation. They're there, but they don't have a formal seat at the table. So that creates difficulties. I think an added difficulty is when national government, when we'll say the president or prime minister, is of a different political persuasion, and this often happens to those that are leading the main cities within, um, within the country. And there is a reluctance for national government to want to work with city government because there's different political agendas there. And, and that makes it very, very difficult. But if you are an investor, you are looking at what is the geopolitical situation within the country, uh, what's the political risk associated with investing in that country, um, what is the long-term strategy for that country, because infrastructure goes way beyond uh, political cycles. So what I'm saying is, is you actually need the multi-level of government to be working together. Yes, national government may set the scene in terms of national government policy, but they need to be empowering local government to deliver on that policy, to align their policy with national government. And in some cases, we also find, you know, I, I alluded to it, that uh, the city government is more progressive and more and further ahead than the national government, and that creates an added difficulty and barrier. So, I'm saying yes, they need to work together, but the reality is it's very, very, very 
difficult uh, for them to do so. And sorry, your final question? To the SDGs alignment. Yeah. And, yeah. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the, so the, of course, New York set up the whole uh, voluntary local review movement. And um, I think it, it's a wonderful initiative that was set up by the city of New York and that they are the host of, of the United Nations. They've seen what was happening at the, the national government level. They've seen the SDGs were adopted by member states. And they said, OK, but what about cities? We're going to implement it. And they started this voluntary local review movement to, um, to look at how cities could implement the SDGs. Um, I personally feel that a lot of cities committed to it, but haven't taken action. So they've produced plans. I also think that citizens, uh, in some cities, citizens know about it. The city is really committed to it, like Helsinki, for example. They have uh, some resources dedicated to it within the city. They have uh, you know, an action plan for what they need to do to implement every single SDG within the city. But a lot of cities don't have uh, you know, the resources of a New York or a Helsinki. So I think many committed, but they're not acting. And um, you know, of course, there's going to be this high-level meeting in New York with the Secretary General focused on cities in April next year. And I think it will certainly come up there about the need for much greater urgency and much greater action. So thank you very much, Elise. Thank you very much, Octavi. And now it's your turn. So you have the opportunity, if you want, just to raise your hands and we will provide you a microphone in order to raise your question to Alice. We have a question from the first row. It's the lady in the front row. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Alice, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, my name is Yvette Camos, and I currently, I recently joined, actually, uh, uh, the main transport operator here in Barcelona, Transport Metropolitano de Barcelona. And before that, I have developed my whole career in the mobility sector between France, Colombia, Central Asia. Well, uh, I wanted to ask you now, uh, with this post-COVID uh, situation that we're having in, in cities all around the world, and especially uh, regarding the financing side, mm. um, I wanted to ask you if you have some uh, successful examples of uh, mobility initiatives that have been built on public-private partnerships, and, and how do you see these, these possibilities to be further developed in order to to reach all these uh, these targets that we have in the different um, uh, in the COP26 and other uh, events that have been held recently. Yeah, thank you. I, I think um, one of of the difficulties that many cities are facing around around the world is how to get people back on public transport, and unfortunately, many people took to their cars during COVID-19. Of course, others took up walking and cycling, and that's, that's great, and using micromobility and so on. But, um, you know, so there has been difficulties uh, during, um, during COVID-19. And I think many public transport providers have been hemorrhaging money. Um, and I recall speaking to one city, a major city, um, during COVID-19, and they were saying, we're very seriously looking at actually shutting down our service uh, for long periods of the day um, because we're just hemorrhaging so much money right now. So, you know, I think, you know, we're seeing that, that these operators are bleeding and we need to find ways and means of assuring people, uh, of course, adhering to public health guidance and advice that uh, public transport is a good way to travel um, so that's one part. Turning to PPPs, I'm going to answer your question generally in relation to PPPs. Um, PPPs are, are an instrument, and, um, but again, I think it's an instrument that you need to carefully look at as a city. It can go wrong from both sides of the coin. From the private sector side, you know, it, Think of something, a, a PPP that's worked very effectively around the world is, is for road schemes, um, intercity road schemes, city road schemes, relatively simple PPPs. And, you know, it's a design, build, and operate model, and they, they, they get revenue from um, building those road schemes. But in so many situations, there's a change of government 
um, will say after the project has become operational and um, the government says, no, we don't want to charge people tolls. So then what you have is a dispute situation. And that, you know, I met one CEO who was in dispute with a particular country for 25 years over a PPP project. So, and, you know, you don't, you sometimes don't have effective arbitration mechanisms to sort of get to a, 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 a result. So that's one side of the coin. The other side of the coin is, and I've seen this in, when I worked in government, is the private sector can be a bad actor in uh, entering into PPP contracts. And in that sense, you know, uh, the private sector sometimes can have the best lawyers and the public sector have minimal resources. They have their, their state lawyers. And there can be clauses in contracts um, that... The, the public sector don't realise are in there. So in, in that context, that can mean that there's a lack of trust from the public sector when engaging in, with the private sector uh, in relation to PPPs. There's also a big issue with public perception of PPPs. The public don't really trust PPPs. They perceive that it's always... Um, it, the the private sector that's going to come out on top, and that's not necessarily the case. So I'm just showing you that there's difficulties associated with PPPs. Uh, government can be the bad actor, the private sector can be the bad actor. So it's really important for any entity that's thinking about a PPP mechanism to be open to all of the potential solutions, but really focus on properly preparing your project, bringing the capacity into your, if it's the public system, in, into your um, public system to ensure that you're properly preparing the project, you're properly structuring the project. The project has the right risk profile. Because if you don't do any of that, you won't attract any form of investment, whether it's a PPP or another mechanism. Um, having said all that, you know, one of the PPPs that everybody was holding up around the world as being the best example of a public transport PPP was actually Quito in Ecuador. But then I'm going to tell you how it was wrong. Um, it was, you know, a really good, uh, you know, mechanism. You also had a mayor that was a lawyer, which was useful. Um, he found a way to get finance from the World Bank, development agencies, etc., to prepare the project, so to, you know, to, to finance the capacity building within the city to properly prepare the project. Entered into the PBP, everything was going brilliant. He left office just when the project was about to open, and two years later, it's still not open. So, you know, so it was supposedly the best example, and then government haven't got their act together <laughs> and it's, it's not um, operating. So we were all looking around the world at that PPP saying, this is the model, this is the model. So even the best examples can go off course when you have a change of politics, for example. Thank you very much, Alice. Thank you very much for your question. Uh, I think we have time for one. Yeah, we have two questions here. A couple of questions. Yeah, please. Good evening. Uh, Thank you very much for your talk. Um, my name is Ekaterina. I'm doing master's degree in Smart Cities, University of Côte d'Azur. And the question I would like to ask is something that I've been thinking about for a long time and I can't find answers. So what pandemic has shown to us is that a lot of people can work from home, even people who were not allowed to work from home before or didn't think that they can work from home, now they can. And Cities are facing problems with CO2 emissions, and we have got traffic jams, primarily because people have to work or have to travel uh, to work. So are there, uh, was there any research done, or are you provisioning any incentives to incentivize companies to encourage people to work from home? That because uh, I think it's quite an easy way. Easy, obviously, it's a bit probably... Um, um, not the right way to say it, but uh, it's an easy way to tackle CO2 emissions, just allow people to be uh, working from home. And this also falls back to 15-minute town agenda, because there is no point to have shop, uh, shops or nursery school where you live if you still have to work from home and you have to do this daily commute. 
So can you please comment on that? Thank you. Okay, so I'm going to say, first of all, the office <laughs> is not dead. Why? Um, so first of all, the office gives you culture, colleagues, and collaboration. And if you don't have colleagues collaborating, you won't have innovation. And, you know, we were talking about why you created this space yes. uh, it, originally, and it's to allow people to collaborate, to innovate. And I, I think that's super important. So, uh, and there's evidence, uh, you asked me if there's a study. So MIT did a really interesting study um, in, in during COVID-19. So they looked at communication across MIT before COVID-19, and they looked at communication during uh, COVID-19. So what did they find? They found that before COVID-19, there was lots of informal connections happening, and there was collaboration across departments. They found since COVID-19, people went into their silos. So you were not spontaneously bumping into that person at a water cooler or not spontaneously meeting that person on campus. So guess what? You're not collaborating. And if you're not collaborating, you're not innovating. So in that sense, you know, I'm back three days a week in the office. Um, so what I really see and what, you know, in our future of, of real estate work that we've done, we're really looking at a hybrid way of working. So that is where we believe that part of our life will be back in the office and part of our life will be at home. But we also have to remember, and you know, I know this from, uh, you know, being asked by staff that work for us that people's mental health was really challenged being at home. So there were some people who were extremely lonely. They didn't have a space in which they comfortably could work with at home. So there was people asking, please, when can we go back to the office? Um, the second thing is, there was many, and I'm a mother, so I can talk to this particular one personally. You're trying to juggle looking after a child and work. It's an impossible situation. <laughs> I can testify to that. Um, and it's quite dangerous for a small child. Uh, so, so in that sense, you know, it's, it's not easy trying to balance uh, your, your home life and your work life in that type of situation. Nobody's winning. And yes, that's, you know, we're not always going to see schools uh, closed. So what I would say to you is, I do not believe the office is dead. I do believe we will go back to the office. Since I went back to the office, you know, I caught up with my colleague in supply chain that I hadn't caught up with in a year. Should I have caught up with her? Yes. You know, so even I'm collaborating with colleagues again and we're seeing the synergies and I think that's super, super important. So the office is not dead. And even, you know, I know Carlos Moreno very well who came up with the 15-minute city concept. Carlos you know, does see a future of the center of the city in, in terms of having offices in the center of the city. But also, I think one of the big things that's, that's coming up in the architecture community is, yes, we're going to have offices and a hybrid working model, but many people who could not, who cannot, rather, work from home in their current conditions, that we may see the development of more localized you know, co-working spaces that people will will occupy within their neighbourhood. And I think that makes sense. Thank you very much, Elise. Uh, I think also from a, a company point of view, uh, depending on the size, uh, in our case, we are also fostering people to decide time to time they work, to work from home. They are, of course, we are allowed to do this. But depending on the case, it's not always possible. And for sure, there is an eager sensibility, uh, sensitivity uh, from the companies regarding the need to make business travels. Because I think what we learned, all of us, is to use uh, Skype and Teams and uh, <laughs> Google Teams and more in order to have meetings uh, and distance, uh, it may be saving some, some long travels. I think this is also something that is happening and can help. So many, many, uh, uh, do we have more questions? Yes, have two questions more, one Please. here on the other side. So. Um, here, hi. Uh, hello, Alice. Um, first of all, thank you for your presentation. It was very interesting. 
I'm a master's student and I'm currently pursuing a master's in city resilience design and management. And from what I've learned, obviously there's concept of smart cities, sustainability, but also resilience. So I'm wondering uh, in your perspective what the synergies are between this concept of sustainability and resilience. Uh, because one of the critiques that I've seen from the academia is that maybe this uh, smart city concept doesn't consider the um, redundancy, because if we all uh, rely on technology and smart grids, um, this time it was a pandemic, but what will be in the future? So really interesting question um, on resilience. And um, first of all, I think that it's something that's top of mind in the insurance sector uh, for quite some time, because they have the most to lose, right? Uh, and But it hasn't been it hasn't got the same attention that climate has. And it's also, you know, I mentioned that we're starting to think about resilience in a different way. So how can we withstand shocks from a financial crisis, a health crisis, a climate crisis? So there's a wider sense of understanding of what resilience is. But at the moment, most of the movements I see um, in the resilience space is around um, nature-based Solutions. So how we can create nature positive cities, the role of nature in making our cities much more resilient. Uh, in terms of the technology side, I think there's a greater focus now on rights and recognizing that within a city, and indeed I talked about this yesterday at an event at the Smart Cities Expo, there's a variety of different vulnerable groups within your city. And it could be women, it could be migrants, disabled people are very particularly affected when it comes to technology. You know, it could be low income workers, refugees. There's a variety of different vulnerable groups within a city. And it's up to the city to identify who those vulnerable groups are and understand their particular needs. So right now, there's a, and older populations also, by the way, are, are within that. And there's intersectionality between those vulnerable groups. But Right now, there's a lot of technology solutions that are not resilient to those different groups of people. You know, you constantly hear from disabled people about how they can't use particular technology systems. Why does that happen? Because they're not brought in to the design process, so their needs are not fully taken into consideration. And in a lot of the conversations that we're having about embracing diversity in the design of technology, disabled people older persons, children, they're generally not part of the conversation. They don't have a seat at the table. So I, I think that that's uh, something that needs a lot of work and, um, and we need to speak up about it, uh, you know, to, to ensure that uh, technology it can, is uni universally designed and it meets the needs of people of all ages and abilities. And I think that that, it, it was good to see at the Smart Cities Expo that there was a bigger focus on inclusion, but you're not seeing enough focus on the needs, particularly of vulnerable groups like disabled persons, the elderly, children, etc. Thank you very much, Alice. Next question. Yeah. Um, hi, Alice. Um, thanks for the, uh, for the speech and uh, the talk. I find it very, uh, very interesting, actually. Um, I'm, I'm kind of like challenged, and uh, my challenge is around um, actual tangible solutions that um, an average person can actually do to, uh, to support this net zero initiative. Um, over the time, over the years, we've seen that um, we've been quite reactive, and I find that as a bit of a challenge. Right now, we're building a lot of our lives around technology. So what happens if technology fails tomorrow? Mm. How do we handle that? Then yeah. we react again. Yeah. And then if something bad happens to us, then we react again. Yeah. So I'm really challenged in that area. I'm trying to understand how are we handling this in such a way that we're able to, uh, one, enable an average person to be able to uh, had to this initiative, to this vision, in a collective manner. That's one part. The other part is to uh, enable communities, no matter how small they are, to be able to form together 
work together, collaborate together, and actually uh, push this forward. And the, uh, the part that um, I find as well very, uh, very difficult is that um, we are not looking at any form of large-scale R&Ds. And um, that becomes a bit of a problem because when we try to implement solutions, those solutions, if they're not well tested, like you mentioned earlier, they just fail. So how do we piece all of these elements together and actually talk about tangible solutions and um, try to actively work uh, towards uh, this vision that we have as a global community. Mm. Thank you. So I, I think it's a really important point. And the, the first thing I want to say is, you know, earlier I mentioned embodied carbon emissions in buildings, and that's relating to emissions from building materials and furnishings. But one of the things we don't really talk very much about is the embodied emissions associated with that smartphone, every technology device. So it takes very significant you know, emissions to produce our technology. And I think that's something that we should bear in mind. So in terms of the, you know, the, amount, of, the amount we use these smart devices is something we personally can consider in terms of being good for our planet. But to get to tangible uh, solutions. Um, I was lucky enough uh, when I worked in Ireland that you know, I got familiar with, uh, in government with an, an amazing movement we had called the Green Schools Movement. And it was ran by an NGO, um, and they had green schools officers. So basically, every single school in the country had a green schools officer. And they taught kids about mobility, how to walk, cycle, use public transport, electric vehicles. They taught kids about biodiversity, how to grow their own food, how to reduce food waste, how to you know, uh, reduce the amount of water that they consumed. And guess what? It was effective. Oh, and by the way, their award was, if they were successful as a school in embracing all of this, was they got a green flag. They still get a green flag, and schools all want to get this green flag, and uh, universities want to get this green flag. So it's been a huge movement. But I think, why was it successful? It wasn't that we had all these children um, going you know, to school and doing all these exciting projects in school. They actually brought that information home. And I always remember the CEO complaining that his five-year-old had been outside the bathroom timing the number of minutes he was in the shower because he wanted to him to reduce the amount of water that he was wasting. So what that green schools movement did was it converted parents, it converted grandparents, so it changed hearts and minds. An initiative focused on children changed hearts and minds. So if I was a city leader right now, that's what I would be doing, right? So on the one hand, I would be investing in infrastructure and technology, but I also would be very focused on these human behavioral shifts. And, you know, they're quick wins. And I think that's really important. Coming back to your point about technology, what happens if the technology switches off? Super important point. Cybersecurity is an enormous risk. And I think our cities are definitely not aware on top of the risk, the cyber risk associated with technology. We're increasingly wanting to integrate technology. That's positive. But equally, we need to put the security systems in place that uh, a city is able to withstand a cyber attack. But to your point, if everything switches off, what do you do? You also need to be able to in the same way retail has to have an online and offline presence, you need to have an online and an offline presence. And coming to consultation with communities, we all know that the most effective way of communicating with communities is actually to go and meet them in person. We all know the value of meeting humans, right? There's meeting virtual humans and then there's meeting actual humans. There's much more value in meeting humans face-to-face -face on their level to understand their needs. And I think there's nothing that's going to you know, take away from that. And a city still has to actively go out there and meet people, not just focus on, on virtual connections with, with communities. Because there's so many communities are not digitally literate. Um, you know, for example, they're not online. 
um, and you're not going to get to all sections of your community in that way. Thank you very much, Alice. Uh, do we have time for another question? Which is the next one? Is this the last one? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. Okay. So maybe that uh, later on, if Alice will stay a little bit with us, maybe we can have a bit more conversations uh, beyond the event. So, so please. This, uh, thank you for, uh, for this presentation, for uh, challenge, challenging us to, to, to do things differently. Uh, and I would like to challenge a little bit more. Uh, my name is Judith Bataille, and I, I, be, I belong to a consultancy company. But um, also, I have a lot of uh, tribus. I, am, I belong to different kinds of communities, some technologies, some, uh, some uh, uh, professional, uh, some just citizens that want to do things differently. And this is why, uh, because you are talking about communities, I would like to, to, to maybe we, we can do things in a different way. Also, not just collaborating with the citizen, not just asking the citizen. It's more about how we co-create things with the citizens, mm. how we make things that uh, citizens can uh, belong to this governance that uh, Metropolis say in a few, few moments ago. So I have seen uh, re really recently a consultancy in, the, in, a, in a city close to here, that is San Feliu de Llobregat, that they are changing the way, the model of the city, and they are asking all the, all the, the citizens who, who wants, who, this, who the new model, no? The, they offer two, three different solutions and all together has to decide which model of city uh, they want. So do you know if there is so many models uh, around the world that use this system to say, hey, citizens, came with me and let's co-create, let's do the city that we want in the future? So I think you're presupposing that you, the city hall, know the solutions for your citizens. And um, I think there's a stage before that. You've got to consult with your citizens to understand their needs. And, you know, I don't know if you watched what happened uh, with the, the elections in the city of Lisbon. So there you had a mayor who uh, was very focused on, on rolling out cycle lanes. Very, very laudable. But, you know, they wanted to roll out 100 kilometres. He quickly increased it to 300, and they rolled out 300 kilometres of cycleways in uh, the city of Lisbon in a really short period of time during COVID-19. And there was huge backlash from citizens. So he'd done an amazing thing. He'd rolled out all these bike lanes, but citizens hadn't been consulted. They didn't believe some of them were in the right location. So he lost the election over it, right? And yes, it was a very tight margin, and of course there was other issues as well, but that was really the big thing, was these cycle lanes. So, you know, what he, did, what he did wrong was that he didn't consult the citizens on, okay, we want to do cycle lanes, but where should the cycle lanes be? Um, you tell us, then you put forward solutions, then they validate. So I think there's, um, there's a continuous journey, and... It, just putting solutions, uh, a solution on the table is probably too early. You need to go earlier to understand their specific needs. So you're creating the right solution to meet the citizens' needs. And even then, you're going to have to adapt that solution um, based on the input that they provide. Is there a perfect model? I don't think there is a perfect model anywhere. Every city, you know, when I worked, you know, I worked previously in, in consulting as well, and we worked with cities all around the world, every city struggles with consultation. And I think the thing is to just try harder. And there, nothing beats getting out there and walking the streets. And, you know, everyone's talking about digital twin technology, and it offers a lot of opportunities. But until you experience space, you can't and experience the people within that space, you can't really effectively think about the types of solutions that are most appropriate. That's my view. 
So thank you very much, uh, Ellis. Thank you very much, Judith. I think with uh, these words, we close the session. So I really want to thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ellis, for being with us and to the public for spending this time with us. Moltes gracias a todos y buenas noches.